Hello, everyone, and welcome to Giants Talk. I'm Cole Kuyper here with everyone's favorite Giants insider, Alex Pavlovich. And I'm we're one talking of one, some so Giants baseball. Automatically. What did we go over last week, episode, uh, Alex? One out of one, batting a thousand That's over true. here. <laughs> I could be everyone's least favorite ever, the one, but I'll take it. I, I Thank guess you. mathematically, you are their least and Thank most you. favorite. Um, but Giants Talk comes to you every Monday and Thursday right here on the NBC Sports Podcast Network, and we are brought to you by Wendy's. <clears throat> Let me uh, get ready for this one again. Raise a glass to Wendy's new bourbon bacon cheeseburger, smothered in a new bourbon bacon sauce. Alex, this is a bourbon masterpiece that you eat, available at participating U.S. Wendy's. You know what? To steal a line from Carrie Crowley, the city is back. I think the Bay Area we've seen the last couple of weeks kind of back. We're all back out and about. So a good time to, to stop through a Wendy's. That's right. That's right. On your way home from the beach, hit up a Wendy's. Summer's here. The city's back. The city's back. I love so that before line. we dive into any, uh, any recap of what went down the past few days, Giants Dodgers, I wanted to break some news. If, you, if our listeners didn't see it on the uh, broadcast on Sunday, I am excited to be hosting some pre and post following in the footsteps of Alex Pavlovich this summer alongside some of my, uh, my lovable idiot friends, Carmen Q, Anthony Garcia, and Teresa Vignal. They are lovable idiots. Um, I'm excited because this means I don't have to do the pre or post game show on a Sunday for like, what, 13 weeks, something like that. So yeah, they, um, they hoodwinked some, some other people into yeah, doing for, it. First of all, thank you guys. I will enjoy my Sundays, <laughs> my Sunday mornings, not hopping on the pregame show. Uh, and the other thing I was thinking, it's actually really funny for me. And first of all, congratulations. And I, thank you. and we should also mention your producer, John Wilson does really, really good work. And he's the best. He is. And I talked to him the other night and he was like, basically, we're just going to have fun. So I, I am, and I know all you guys, so I know you're going to do it. So would highly recommend it. And it's also funny for me because you and I are like now podcast host BFFs, but you're actually the one of those four that I know the least well. So I, it's, it's funny to see like that, that group up there. Um, I, I used to cover high school football games with Therese like 12 years ago. So I, I go wow. way back with, with everybody in this crew. Um, very excited for you guys. And I think that that's next Sunday and then every Sunday through what, Labor Day? Through Labor Day. And judging by how the Giants played this past Sunday game, hopefully that means there are good things to come on Sundays. I would have loved to have done a post game for that game. I know. It would have been a good day to, to really start off. But you have um, next what, week. Who is it next week? The Cubs? Cubs at home? Cubs oh, at wait, home. I'll take it. Yeah, that's Let's do one. it. Um, I want to do something a little different this episode because since uh, over the past year, I've been binge watching a lot of TV. Um, I did Shit's Creek, Ted Lasso, Banshee, Clone Wars, and this uh, this Dodgers Giants series felt like I was watching some high drama, well scripted, prestige HBO television. Just like all the story beats were there, the payoffs, foreshadowing, it was perfect. Um, so I kind of want to run through it like we just finished binge watching a TV show, recap episode by episode how it went down this past crazy weekend of Giants baseball. What do you think? I like it. Can I tell you my best binge story? I miss originally Game of Thrones, just never got involved. And oh. it, I watched, somebody told me to watch it and I tried to watch one episode and it was very confusing when you jump in in the middle and it was the one where they poured yeah. gold over that guy's head and he was like melting and I was like, nah, this isn't for me. So yeah, I just the gave series up. Targaryen got yeah, his golden crown. It. And then uh, the final season's coming up and um, my now fiance, but then girlfriend was adamant that it was going to be something we were doing every Sunday. So one off season, I just binged the whole thing and watched like five hours of Game of Thrones, Thrones every day for like however long it takes to get through it. But I literally was like, that's what I was doing. I'd write my story for the day and then just watch Game of Thrones. And it's a great way to watch it, to go back. It's great to miss out on something and then go back and be a part of it. So anyway, we'll do the same thing here. With anybody who missed out on this oh. Giants series, you can come be a part of our four game binge. Give me one quick hot take on the ending of Thrones. Bran the Broken taking the throne because he has the best story. I was not a fan. So yeah. I was, yeah, I was there. I think there's some rumors that they might like redo the end or redo the final season. <laughs> when people were actually discussing that seriously, you know, you screwed up. Yeah. But the yeah, Sunday they... Giants game much better than the game. That's of right. 
The payoff was incredible, but let's start with, with episode one, which was Thursday's game. It was the weird bullpen game for the Dodgers. David Price started and Dodgers scored early. So it was, it was uncomfortable right off the bat, especially considered the Dodgers had dominated the Giants in the last series so hard. Um, Giants struck back a little bit, and then your boy DJ Peters home run. Yeah, watched him hit two against Bumgarner in one inning one time. Can I say, first of all, I want to go back to the bullpen game thing. It is so weird to me to see, and it tells you something about what the Giants have done here, to see the Dodgers in a position where they've had injuries. Like, they've had – they lost Tony Gonsolin basically the whole year so far. He's on his way back. Dustin May is having Tommy John surgery. So there's been some bad luck there. But to see a team like that have to go to bullpen games, like I think four weeks in a row now, four times through the rotation, something like that. And the Giants haven't had to get there yet. You know, they've, they've had some injuries in the rotation. They plugged in Logan Webb. They plugged in Scott Casimir the other day. He wasn't so good out of the bullpen, but he was pretty good in that one start. So I think it's another thing that they have done right. They they have more starting depth than we thought, and um, they were prepared for this. And they haven't had to go to the bullpen games yet, which their rival have. That bullpen game we're talking, we're like criticizing the Dodgers for, do, for doing is the only one they won. <laughs> um, but it Alex worked. Wood didn't look like he had that same stuff. I mean, it was a home run fiesta for both teams. Yeah, and he, he said he tried to change his strategy. He tried to go fastball heavy, and it – did not work. He had a lot of regrets after that one. Yeah, and both uh, Longo and Solano had some some big flies, but overall, Giants lose. They kept it close, but Max Muncy took one off in the sixth, and not much happened to that. Dodgers four, Giants three. Now let's get in to episode two, Friday night's game, because that's where things started to get a little more interesting. I might say, yeah, most exciting game of the year, most exciting game in the last two years, maybe three. Possibly, yeah, possibly. I'd have to think back. Yeah, it could be. The Giants had some good ones last year and some important ones in September. But that, you know, they haven't had it. And we said this after the Bauer series in, in San Francisco, like that felt like Giants Dodgers. And then on Friday, like that felt like Giants Dodgers. And it, it was back and forth and it was crazy. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, a game where all of a sudden it's, Everybody's paying attention to everything happening in that game um, from the baseball world. So these were the games the Padres and Dodgers were having yeah. as we looked in the but window. You and I jealously. were jealous of. We were watching a bunch of Rockies games, and we were like, "Can we get some of this?" And to be frank, so, I didn't know when the Giants got there if they would be able to have games like that. We didn't know if they'd be this good. So, no, no, but it, uh, things really took off in the eighth and ninth. That Buster Posey home run made me lose my mind. Um, really cracked it open and i don't know i i was riding high i thought that was it call it there i'm feeling good were you confident after that posy home run yeah i finished my story um my game oh, story. that's right you were on post game i watched you i was on talk post about having to rewrite your whole deal i finished it i went into the studio with my laptop i hit send from um from the studio i'm gonna get in trouble for this because i know how people believe in jinxes Every once in a while, I'm, I'm in a situation where I have to send that game story in like the top of the ninth or the bottom of the eighth. Or usually, if it's a blowout, if it's like eleven to one, I'll send it to the guys on the web desk, get them a little bit of a head start so they're not rushing after the final out. So this one, I send it to them, and I was like, "Hey, I'm on the post game show. Hopefully, they don't blow this." And literally, like four minutes later, Austin Barnes hits that home run. Um, so I had to send an email to them again and be like, "Oops!" in all caps. I will rewrite the top of the oh. story, but oh. it was, yeah, that was, a, we were on set, like we're, and people don't realize you'll be doing this soon, but we're standing there, like we're standing in front of that giant board um, with Greg Popper, wow. Randy Wynn, we're ready to go. And, you know, all of a sudden we're not, we're sitting down again and, and watching the, watching the game and listening to, to the guys in our earpiece. So for the, the listeners who didn't see this go down live, Barnes, with two outs off of Tyler Rogers, knocks one out to tie the game. And up next is Albert Pujols. And Pujols hits a just monster shot. What was the reaction standing next to Randy Wynn and Greg Papa when Talkman reaches over and snakes that? Randy Wynn's very cool at all times. Greg Papa went nuts. So that was, that was, a, that was a fun one. And then we all and sat then, down and we're like, all right, extra innings. 
Let's do it. We get we get a little breather before we dive into. I was television. I was like, all right, open the laptop. We're back to work here. So back to work. Game went into extra innings. Giants scored the Manfield runner. Um, Lamont Wade had some heroics. Wait, you I, what hate do you think the Manfield of him? runner? I do. Do you um, like I, it now? Absolutely not, dude. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I maybe do you like I it when you see that if, Albert Pujols is on second base and he's the Dodgers' best chance to score. That was hilarious. I felt bad for him out there. Like yeah, that's just an injury risk. He got out, he got a little lucky actually that the Giants scored three because it would have been awkward if they were if they just scored on Wade's single, mm-hmm. and then he is the tying run on second base, and literally every single person watching was thinking the same thing. Like someone's going to have to hit this one into a gap or off a wall, or there's going to have to be yeah. two singles away from a fielder. Yeah, we were all thinking the same thing, but his run didn't yeah. matter. Exactly. If if it had been a one run game, it would have been a whole different attitude. And, you know, he would have had to have tried some aggressive base running that he didn't look like he was up for. He looked when he's running the bases, he looks like like Bruce Bochy running out to, uh, to a pitching change. He does. He does. Somebody um, the other night they put up his sprint speed and I think it was 22.3 was his average for the year. And it was during that game and somebody in studio went, oh, that's like that's what he was on that play. That, that's pretty slow. And somebody else goes, no, that's his average. Like 27 is average in MLB. 22 is like 47 year old catcher but he had a really good series so we shouldn't make fun of him too much yeah hey fair play come on he's good i do you know how much he's making this year alex he's fine 23 million yeah yeah i think we're not hurting uh, albert pujols's feelings uh harlan garcia wrap that one day and i'm gonna be like man i made a lot of jokes about albert pujols back in the day and now i can't even get out of bed what goes around comes around alex and we're not even athletes so we can't blame it on that it's not, I oh. can't even say I hit 670 homers. Just, I just got old. Giants closed out the 10th, I don't know, I'd say relatively drama-free. Um, oh. And that felt good. That was like the most confident I've been in our bullpen. The, the extended lead that Longo gave us certainly helped, but most exciting game of the year. That was absolutely incredible. That, that was, was the Red Wedding, or the, the episode where he, the guy gets his head popped in Game of Thrones. There was only one problem with that game, aside from it being super exciting. It kept me there kind of late in the studio. Okay. And which I don't mind, but I walk out onto Harrison. I had parked there at about midnight, and I had, for the first time in 10 years, fallen victim as a San Francisco resident to the back window, smashed in. No. no. Yeah. They take anything? No, this is so this is hilarious. People who listen to this a lot know that. Um, I talk about my little puppy, Robert, quite a bit. And we have his crate in front of that window. And it's kind of wedged because it makes a lot of noise when we drive. So it's wedged between Mm -hmm. the the two seats. And it appears that whoever did it smashed the back window could literally not get anywhere because they couldn't get over his crate in the back seat. And I think people do these things really fast. Like they're like in and out in like 25 seconds or whatever. I don't know. I've never done it. I, I assume they do it really fast. So they did not, there was no, nothing valuable in the car anyway, because I've, I've lived here too long to know that lesson. But um, that was the only downside of that night. But it was hilarious when I, the next morning after I had calmed down, I was like, that is funny. I can't imagine somebody smashing a car window thinking they're about to get a laptop or whatever, and they can't get over this dog crate in the back seat. Oh, Robert saved you from getting robbed, man. He's he like a good guard yeah. dog. He, he saved us when he wasn't even there. But yeah, it was a... San Francisco, man, it's bound to happen, right? It happened to A Rod, so I got away with it much. I did not lose as much as A Rod did when he was here two years ago or whenever. Isn't it your first one? Yeah, I've lived here since 2011. First one. Oh, you're so overdue, dude. You're playing on house money. It's one of those things where you're really pissed when it happens. And then, like, two days later, I was like, how did that not happen in 2012? Like, that was so. Yeah, you go. Like, like, it's happened to me twice, and I don't even live out there just from like, visiting i know everybody i talked to afterwards was was like oh yeah that happened to me twice in three weeks one time in like 2014 <laughs> like yeah yeah cool yeah. great happens. work san francisco anyway, all right baseball team is good baseball great. team is good yeah. let's let's move on to game three saturday's game this was a spicy game i mean if, if i were to tell you who the dodgers had on the mound that they'd score their first of six runs in the first inning, including a Pujols-like like record-tying home run or whatever, 
would how would you feel about the Giants chances of winning that game zero percent not good this was a um this was the Urias game we should mention that was like yes. the worst start of his career and we didn't really coming talk off about, of almost perfect gaming the Giants yeah, last week and we didn't really talk about Buer on Friday night the Giants did get to him a little bit too and, and looked much better against him which I think Ultimately, big picture coming out of the series, that's one of the best things that they have done is that last weekend they got completely overwhelmed by three really good pitchers. And we rightfully start to wonder, and I think a lot of the fan base started to wonder, like, this is a good lineup. They've done a nice job, but can they hit good pitching? And so they come back a week later, they didn't see Bauer. We'll get to him at some point because he's always part of the story. But of course. they do a nice job against Bueller. Um, and, and put a lot of pressure on him. And, and then they just completely wrecked Urias the next day. So I, I, was, I think it really, you know, one, it tells you a little bit about how prepared they are and the work they probably did between those, those four or five days to be ready. But I think it should make people feel a lot better about September and potentially October, the fact that they were able to get to guys like that. Because that's not, you know, that's not the Marlins pitching staff. Those are two of the better pitchers in the National League. It's weird that I almost felt like that a uh, Talkman catch on Friday changed the course of the Giants season. It's just a total attitude adjustment. And they looked like a different group, group of guys heading into Saturday's game. They were swinging confidently. I mean, this is just like nonsense fan talk. I don't have any analytics to back that <laughs> up, but, but it was incredible. I think Gabe Kapler would say we would have come in Saturday feeling the exact same way no matter what happened on Friday night. I did say that on the post game on Friday too, and I, I agree with you. I, if you think about it, and more from the other perspective, if you think about the Dodger perspective, if they had come back and won that game on a home run by Albert Pujols, who they picked up off the scrap heap two, three weeks ago, and he would hit a walk-off against your rival, and you're like, we still don't have our full lineup, but we have guys like Albert Pujols coming in here and um, completing comebacks. If they had scored four runs off of Tyler Rogers, who's the best pitcher the Giants have in their bullpen. I think that does a lot for them and, and they're feeling pretty good, but instead they're looking at it and going, well, then they got to Kenley Jansen. So I, I did think that was a big swing game on Friday night. One thing I noticed was they put up crooked numbers in the second, third, fourth, seventh, and eighth innings. That's a lot of not just easy runs. You know, they, they had rallies in more than half the innings of the game. Yeah, and they needed it, so it was kind of. It, it got a little hairy there for maybe like five minutes, so it was good that they kept adding on. But it, look, it's guys coming off the bench too, and, and this is one thing we've talked so much about. Like, Was it Dave Fleming who came on the podcast and was like, no disrespect to Kelby Tomlinson, but they don't have Kelby Tomlinson coming off the bench anymore? Something like I think, I think it was. It was. Dave. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about that for a long time, and just basically, it. you know, is there anybody – Maybe short of Kurt Casale, who's had a really rough year, who if they came in, would you, you would feel like is not going to have a good plate appearance, is not going to – even Talkman is, doesn't have high batting average, hasn't hit a whole lot, but you feel like he's at least going to see six pitches. Like when Steven Duggar comes in right now, you feel really good about it. Yeah. So. There, I mean, for a team that's like almost all batting below 300, I'm not freaking out at any guy at the plate because Sally maybe just because we know the alternative is Buster Posey who we yeah. unfortunately don't get to play every every game of every series um, but I know what you're saying it it feels like I'm confident in guys that maybe I shouldn't be statistically but I am and guys who have been here we've done mm -hmm. the Steven Duggar thing already and I, I've always been a big fan of Duggar but it, it's crazy to see him come up and you, you think like he's going to get to this guy like the way he's swinging, he's going to get to this guy. And that's just another, you know, it's where, it's where they are right now. Um, they, go, they go much deeper than the eight. And we've talked about the line changes. But I thought Friday night and then Saturday's game as well were when they kept adding on late. And you keep bringing new guys in and they keep adding on. And Flores has three hits on Saturday, comes out. Lamont Wade comes in for him, reaches base right away. So that to me is what stood out on Saturday. I saw people making jokes about how Flores got revitalized by the Friends reunion. Because for people who don't know, he's a huge Friends fan. I think everybody knows at this point. <laughs> Poor guy, every interview he's done in the last two years has, uh, has come up. you think Rachel and Ross should have stayed together, Wilmer? Hey, Wilmer, All right, what's next your favorite question? episode of Friends? What's your all-time favorite? Uh, so in the end of that game, Giants put up 11 runs, which is the most they've scored since last September when they put up 14 against the A's and 23 against the Rockies. I looked that stat up, and I'd forgotten about that Rockies game. 
Was that the Dickerson game? I think, I think so. That was just like was a surreal game. experience. That was their most at Dodger Stadium since 2013. And I remember that game, uh, which that was a surreal game being there. But um, yeah, it, it's been a while since they've done this. Yeah. So let's, let's move on to the, uh, the season finale of Giants versus Dodgers in May. And that was Sunday's game. Game four, Clayton Kershaw versus Kevin Gosman, the battle of the aces. Although it feels weird saying about that saying that about the Dodgers because they have pretty much an entire rotation of aces. Um, But Kershaw versus that Giants lineup with no Buster Posey looked grim. And yet, how about that first inning Alex Pavlovich? Yeah, I kind of – I don't want to pat myself on the back because I didn't say it publicly, but I kind of – You can do it. I kind of saw this one coming just because they've done a nice job with that right-handed lineup this year. And they do a a really – and they don't have Darren Ruff, so and they didn't have Buster Posey, but – you know, Austin Slater does a really nice job when he's the leadoff man against lefties. And Dubon's been starting to swing a better bat. So yeah, you could kind of see this one. And I, I'm sure a lot of Giants fans felt more confident on Sunday than they have in a long time in that matchup. And the flip side of it is you know that Kevin Gosman's on the mound too. So you, you know that if they can get to Kershaw, as they did, that they have a pretty good shot. And so this wasn't maybe the matchup, the most the mismatch that that most people around the country would have thought on paper. I hope Giants fans felt pretty good going into this game, even, even though it was Kershaw. I, I don't know that I did. I mean, I, the Kershaw thing was definitely a cloud over the situation, but Giants felt hot. Like we talked about after the talking catch, this was an entirely different team. Uh, Dubon hit that home run off the foul pole. I believe that's his second home run off Kershaw off the foul pole. Um, and then I'm sure you saw he did his little sword thing at home plate which, of course, Trevor Bauer had something to say about online after the game. He did. So Trevor Bauer actually changed my mind on this because initially when I saw it, I was – and I'm 100% pro bat flip, pro celebration, and I, I think I even said after the Bauer thing that Dubon was the most likely to do something if mm-hmm. they, they did this. But it felt – to do Bauer's celebration against Kershaw to me felt like a, just a little bit gross just because I, I view Kershaw as like their Buster Posey. Yeah. I was like, if it was the flip side, like Buster has never shown anybody up in his career and doesn't do stuff like that. And, and probably has kept a lot of giants from doing stuff like that over the years. Actually, I, I know that just the way the clubhouse has been, and sometimes it's unsaid, but young players come into that clubhouse and know that we're not one that, that does stuff like this, which, so I, the fact they did it um, against Kershaw made me a little bit like Kershaw doesn't do that either, you know? So it's like, you're showing up a guy who, who never shows anybody up. But then Trevor Bauer goes on Twitter and gets pissed about it. And I'll read his tweet here because I, I pulled it up for the podcast. He, he, of course, saw it. And he goes, people out here, not very good grammar in this tweet. <laughs> he was trying to be cool. People out here covering an eye after hitting with two eyes open and sorting the wrong pitcher. You all fools. Which is a very strange. Let- and he was like trying to defend himself is like he wasn't he was like no I'm not salty at all he was tweeting at a bunch of Giants fans and saying no I'm not let it be known he tweeted just like a few days ago love the sword celebrations I'm seeing y'all do so come on bro you can't have it both ways my initial reaction was save that for when you do something against Bauer but then Bauer tweeted about it and my second reaction was well it it made Bauer salty so (laughs) I'm I'm cool with it I had a slight wonder in my head if Bauer got a talking to from Kershaw after the game. Like, bro, look what they're, what they're doing to me out there. You got you to gotta say something about this. Yeah, and we're, I think we've talked about this. We're a pro-Kershaw podcast. There, I, I'm, I'm very pro-Kershaw. I just feel like he's not a guy who would ever do that to somebody um, and doesn't, I don't think is, you know, I bet Kershaw is not a fan of Bauer's antics. So Okay. How, which of these situations is more worthy of a celebration, though, Alex? A new player hitting a home run off the foul pole off of Clayton Kershaw, future Hall of Famer, or a Cy Young Award winner striking out Alex Dickerson? The, the home run is the celebratory moment. Is, no, and so here's my thing. 100% flip the bat, go crazy. I would have been mm-hmm. – I felt like he did the Bauer celebration to a guy who doesn't celebrate. So I was like, save the Bauer celebration for Bauer. I see what but, you're saying, and it does make sense. Yes. No, I, if, if Dubon would have flipped that bat to the moon, all good, man. Dubon <laughs> has a good time. So – and I again, like I'm not criticizing him. I, I, 
I wish they had saved it for Bauer, but then I saw Bauer's tweet and was like, actually, I don't wish they had saved it for Bauer because Bauer got pissed off about it. And so this was his chance to do it. So he, he did. And of course, Bauer was salty about it. And I also don't understand the one eye thing because he did the one eye thing in spring training in like the second inning of a random game. Like he's not doing it in big league games. So yeah. you, you can't say Tatis can't cover his, his eye after he homers off you because the one eye celebration is, is yours when you don't actually do it in games that matter. So anyway, we've gone off on Bauer again, but. We're, we're just a few weeks away from copyrighted baseball celebrations that certain players aren't allowed to that's do. That's what he wants. Just like, He's like, yeah. this is my celebration. Don't do it. So that, that. Don't do it. The bottom line is that completely flipped me on Dubon doing it. I was like, good, because you, you got under this guy's skin. And Fantastic. it makes it more interesting the next time you face him. All right, so that was the first time the Giants scored three runs off Kershaw in the first inning ever. I was wondering if it was the first time they'd led the game off with two hits off Kershaw ever, let alone what they ended up doing. So this was a rare Giants ownage off of Clayton Kershaw. Slater piled on a little bit in the third with a home run. And then we got to see the rare uh, pitcher RBI. Um, I don't know. It's got to be up there with some of my favorite pitcher RBIs, including um, Barry Zito in the playoffs, Bumgarner's home runs, but Kevin Gosman got his little single in the fourth to drive a run home, which it ended up being a one-run game. There we go, Gosman. Do it yourself. It was important, and it remains hilarious to me that Kevin Gosman is a left-handed hitter. Just learned it when he was young and never changed. I love it. Fantastic. Uh, Giants had a chance to pile on a little bit more in the seventh. Bases loaded, and Joe Kelly was on the mound, and I was ready to, like, fire off some, some memes and jokes about Joe Kelly, who's always down to talk trash. But the Dodgers squirmed out of it, striking out three in a row. Yeah, Joe Kelly talks a lot of trash to the Astros, though. So That's true. He's, he's laser-focused on one yeah. fan, fan base. Yes. And I think, I think like, 29 fan bases were 100% pro Joe Kelly when he, he tried to fight him. Yeah. And gave that face as he walked off the field. There we go. For those who aren't listening, I'm just doing a perfect Joe Kelly face. Yeah, exactly. You get a look at our handsome mugs. Um, Muncie home runs in the eighth, eighth, put the Dodgers on the board. And then, of course, making up for two days earlier, Albert Pujols hits one in the ninth to make it a one-run game. And all of a sudden, Giants fans are sweating after what seemed like a no-doubter. Yeah, it's... They, you know, it, it can never be easy. I didn't even think Saturday, like ultimately it was 11 to six, but there was one point, I think they cut it to seven, four and before uh, Duggar and Longoria got going there. So it, um, it's never, but even the flip side of that, Urias had the perfect game last Sunday and the Giants were like inching back in that one. So mm-hmm. um, both these teams are kind of the same way. They're never like fully dead. They're g- going to make you work until the 27th out. It was, it was a fantastic series. How do you think Cody Bellinger looked overall coming back facing big league pitching for the first time in a while? Because he was crushing those minor league pitchers. I think I was listening to KBR and they talked about how he was just ending baseball careers down there in the minors. <laughs> yeah, it didn't quite go Jacob DeGrom, eight strikeouts in three innings <laughs> uh, against. By the way, shout out to Sam Long, who pitched uh, the Sacramento native, got promoted from double A AA to triple A. And we're overdue for like a minor league session section. Maybe we do this next week or the week after. But Sam Long's from Sacramento. The Giants picked him up, had a big spring. We've talked about him on here before. And we have those are struck out struck out the first eight, I think, or the first six. He struck out eight of like the first nine in Sacramento. Something crazy. He definitely struck out the first six batters he faced. So have a day. He is Good on for the you. way. Sam Long's on the way. But I forgot where I was going with all this. I just wanted to talk about Sam Long real fast because he's had a nice start. But yeah, completely fair. What was your question? Do you remember? No question. Okay. Um, well, oh, Cody Bellinger. Oh, Cody. Uh, yeah. We don't need to focus anymore on any individual Dodgers players. No, Dodgers it, are in the rearview mirror. We've got a different LA team coming into town. Look right. I'll just say that. But all right, he'll get there. He'll get there. I've been there. We we're all in a funk, Cody. It takes a while. Um. Angels are on the horizon. That was the last four games against the Dodgers. Giants took the series uh, three games to one, which was fantastic. It felt like a, uh, you know, a statement series after they had their statement series in San Francisco last week. So Giants fans riding a high right now with the Angels coming in. Um, no trout coming in from the Dodgers. Yeah, yeah. 
Let's do it. So if you look at it, the Padres have the edge over the Dodgers, but it's very, they've been very close. The Giants have the edge over the Padres. It's very close. It's five to four there. Um, and then again, it's four to four here. Now we're, what is it? Four to three here. Now Dodgers, Giants. So anyway, the point of all that is that we have these three teams that are way at the top of the National League. They happen to be in the same division. And this is just more evidence, I think, that the third team, the team that we do a podcast about, is legitimate and is, is going to hang with them. And, you know, this isn't necessarily a fluke because they've done – they haven't been – it's one thing if you're like five and four against the Padres, but you're one and six against the Dodgers. But mm-hmm. they've hung with those teams. So that's the final thing I'll say. I think it's, it's important that they've hung with the two teams that all of us thought were far and away the best teams in the National League going into the season. And it, I, even looking at more than wins and losses, the run differential for those three teams is yeah. insane. They're leading the league by far. So the NL West or the NL best is just blowing everyone away. And it's nice to see national media finally, finally recognizing how good the Giants are this year. But it's also kind of scary to see that because it kind of makes me feel like we're getting jinxed. I don't think you have the capability to jinx us, Alex, but maybe like, Nightingale or someone does. I was about to say, Bob Nightingale tweeted about Kevin Gosman tonight. So if something happens here, we all know what happens when Bob Nightingale tweets a positive thing about your team. He needs to be banned like the former president. Like, get him out of here. He's, he's tweeting irresponsibly. Please do that. I would recommend people after this podcast go and find that tweet from Sunday night when he tweeted about Gosman and go and read the replies because it is just a bunch of Giants fans going like, oh, no, Bob, no. <laughs> Everything was going so well, and then you had to. <laughs> and Bob's a nice guy; I know him pretty well. But his tweets are can be a jinx. So yeah. they got like on his the radar. modern the modern SI cover curse. It since is. people don't Bob read Matt magazines Gilles. anymore. Yeah, that's the one. Um, all right, let's let's dip our toe into the Angels pool just a little bit because I kind of wanted to just laugh a bit about the Bart story. I'm sure you read the Bart story, but how hilarious is that? But it also kind of robbed the Giants fans of seeing Otani pitch. You you asked me earlier in the year the if I would, anyway. Was he going to? Yeah. Oh, I read some writers say he was going to uh, pitch the last game of the the Angels Giants series. Um, but either uh, way, even if he wasn't now going I'm annoyed, to, but yeah, you um, you asked me if I was sad Giants weren't going to see Clayton, Clayton Kershaw last time around, and I wasn't. But yeah. I was. I am yeah. sad they're not going to see Otani. Yeah, uh, you know, I was to be honest when Trout got hurt. I was bummed because I looked at this. He might miss all the Giants games this year, and we don't see Mike Trout very often. So, and he's in his prime. So I, I was bummed about that. I think he has not come to Oracle Park a whole lot, and it, it would have been really cool to see him and Otani um, for a couple of days. We should hopefully see Otani in the outfield or, or in the lineup mm-hmm. at some point. But yeah, it would have been nice if they had. I wish they had set that up because they do kind of, you know, get creative with his schedule. And I wish they had set it up so he could pitch and hit for himself in the National League game and as opposed to doing it in an American League game, just go out and pitch against the A's, which he ended up doing. But he's not going to pitch against the Giants now. And hopefully the next series they see him, I, I hope, because that would be a lot of fun. That's a guy I want to see. For those of you who didn't hear the Bart story, I'm sure you did. Everyone who listens to this podcast is fairly baseball media savvy. Uh, but Otani, was, there was a – traffic accident on the bridge and he was coming from his hotel in San Francisco to the Coliseum. And since there was so much traffic, he had to take Bart and got on the wrong train. I don't know if he got led astray by a gate agent or a fellow passenger, but he did not make it to the Coliseum in time to warm up for the game. It was funny too. Cause at first they were just like, yeah, something happened on Bart. And every single person who lives in the Barry was like, yeah, you got on the wrong train, bro. Like, don't, don't tell us something happened on Bart. You, we, we've been there. We've all been there. You got on the wrong train. You missed your train. You missed the connection. You're in Bay Point all of a sudden, yeah, looking you, around. Yeah. All of a sudden, you looked up, and you were headed to the airport, and you <laughs> felt like you were going the wrong way. So it's okay. I think they admitted it the next day, but they tried to, at first, be like, something happened with Bart. He didn't get there in time to warm up. Can't blame it on Bart, because Bart, Bart will fire back. They'll they defend did. themselves. They They're always willing to. Bart did they? Very, they are very active on Twitter. They Good fired back. Them. They were like, there were no delays on any line to, to the Coliseum. Good for them. And I don't know, I, I feel like one of the reasons I have such a special place in my heart for Shohei Otani is because I was convinced in every cell in my body 
that the Giants were going to sign him. I know that was. I'll have a story about this on our website on Monday. Um, looking back on it, I, I, did, I texted Bobby Evans to get some more info about it because he was a, a big part of that. And it is like, I kind of felt the same way back at the time. You, you start thinking about it, you're like, this makes a lot of sense for this guy mm-hmm. to come over here. The Giants had a very specific plan. And I remember Bobby and Jeremy Shelley went to Japan to see him in September, I think, of that year. Bruce Bochy, after one of the games that season, and they lost 98 games, so he had plenty of free time after – losses to to do other things was I remember after one of the games he was watching Otani clips he was starting to think about him already and they sent Bochi they sent uh Buster Posey was part of the meeting with him down in LA they were one of the finalists they were one of the few teams to get an in-person meeting with him and his agent and they really pulled out all the stops to try to bring him here and felt like they had a good plan he could play the outfield he could pitch he would get about 300 plate appearances a year playing the outfield I think the two days before his start something like that, he would start preparing for a start and wouldn't play. But they were ready for it, and, and Bochi was excited. And, um, you know, they were like, look what we've done with Baumgartner. We've let him pinch hit. We've let him face uh, Chapman. You know, like, we're, we're ready. We're ready to turn the page. And ultimately, they felt like he wanted to be in the American League and, and felt like he wanted to be in uh, Los Angeles as well and, and be in that big market. So it didn't work out, but that is kind of a what if. Like, when you see what he's become and you're like, oh, man, what if he was – what if he was here? Oh, yeah. And I, I think maybe the Bay Area had just used up all of their uh, their luck on the Durant signing. And after that, it was like we got our once in a blue moon superstar yeah. out of free agency. It's funny, too, because I don't know that he would have made a huge difference in 2018 and 19. He, he did end up getting hurt. So it's not like he would have really changed the fortunes of, um, you know, the, the group that he would have joined. But – He would have been around. He would have been under team control and would have been at this point. I assume he'd be doing the same thing with the Giants. Maybe, you know, maybe they'd find a way to even pitch him more because or or use him in a different way. Uh, We've seen what they've done with everybody. So, yeah, he would have been like the superstar hitting his prime when they were ready to, to go on a run. Yeah, you're making me sad, Alex. I'm just imagining this alternate universe. Because don't forget, that's true. You're bringing me back down to earth. But in that same, like, same like month or week I was convinced about Otani. I thought Stanton was coming our way too. <laughs> me, me and Ahmed Farid spent a whole week in the studio nine to five. Just re- we were literally ready for a whole week to go live on TV if either one of those guys ended up as a giant. And it was two outs in the ninth inning. It was all day, every day. We were just sitting there, like, watching other things, watching, like, daytime TV. And I think we filmed, like, a fake commercial at some point. I have it somewhere on my phone. Like, This is when you should have watched Thrones. I know. I should have done it. That might have been the offseason I did it, actually. And that might have been when I – might have taken me away from it. But, <laughs> no, we were fully – because it felt like they were going so hard after those two guys. It felt like one of them was going to end up here. Even, even if, like, individually you look at the cases and it was like, Stan doesn't necessarily want to come here. Otani has a bunch of choices. He might want to be in the American League, but they were so hard after those two at the same time that you just think they're going to get their star and and they go zero for two and then trade for McCutcheon and Longoria, which well, Evan Longoria is doing great. So, but it, it was just a very it was an interesting off season. There is no guarantee in those alternate universes where the Giants sign those guys that they take three out of four from the Dodgers this weekend. So we're on track. We're in the the best possible universe, maybe. You know, to be honest, like, there's an alternate universe where the Giants get Stanton and maybe are a little bit better in 2018 and to the point that they don't make these wholesale changes. Like, they have changed the entire front office, the entire coaching staff. Maybe if, if they add one or two pieces, huge pieces, to the previous core, like, we're not here right now. So, yeah, there could be an alternate universe where this year is a, a rebuilding year. Not taking three wanna, out of four from the Dodgers. I want to end this, uh, this episode on some, uh, some very positive news. I think every Giants fan enjoys updates on this. This is a cool story from the SFSPCA volunteer newsletter about a volunteer named Sue who was checking in a clinic guest, and she asked what their dog's name was, and the person said, Sai. And Sue responded, oh, Sai, that's the name of Tim Lincecum's dog. And the person responded, I am Tim Lincecum. So we've got Tim Lincecum sightings in the city again. It's like a Bigfoot sighting and everyone 
in Giants fan bases across the city get so excited. So we got a Timmy sighting. We got a sighting of his dog. Made my heart warm today when I read that news. It was a fun one. Isn't it amazing that we don't get this like every two weeks? That, right? Like, I think, what was the last one? Somebody saw him at the airport or something? I think like it's, you know, if you're going I to the- I saw him, I saw one last year at, maybe two years ago at the Women's March. I saw yeah. one last year at the airport. So he pops up like once a year. I bet wearing a mask this past year has done wonders for him because no yeah. one's stopping him with a mask on. He was a no big long hair guy too. Like even in hot weather would wear a beanie. So I, mm-hmm. and I, I think that's a good reminder of like how normal baseball players look when they're not on the field. And you know, he's not six foot eight. Like you're not going to yeah. miss Kevin Durant if he's walking down market street. But, uh, and I've seen some of these guys out. Like I remember one time I saw Pablo Sandoval walking in the mall and I knew him cause I covered him. Literally nobody realized it was Pablo. Cause it's, I was outside Wrigley field, maybe yeah, however many years ago, a decade, half a decade ago. And Tim Winscombe was hailing an Uber right there outside the front gates of Wrigley with drunk fans walking right past him, long hair flowing. Nobody recognized him. I'm happy for Timmy. I really enjoyed covering him. My conversations with him, like randomly, he would talk to you like two hours before start all of a sudden he'd be like, Hey, where do you live in the city? What's your favorite part of the city to live? I'm looking for a new, he moved all around the city. He wanted to, to try out a bunch of different spots in San Francisco. So it's cool that, uh, and, and quite frankly, I'm happy that he has this anonymity because I know that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just surprised we don't get these Bigfoot moments more often where, where people yeah. see him somewhere. But you know what? Maybe we shouldn't. Good for people who are, are seeing Tim Linscombe at a restaurant or seeing him walking, walking sigh and, and just let him live his life. Because I, I, I know that's important to him. And yes. he will come back eventually. And we saw him at Bruce Bochy's thing. And, and every time we see him, it's, it's that much bigger of a deal because we don't see him very often. Right. Leave Timmy alone, people, but, but still appreciate him in your heart of hearts. Yes, I like it. That was a good way to end this. And good to hear that Sai is doing well because I think we knew about Sai a little bit. So yeah, um, that works out well. But that was a good one. Again, I will plug your first show is Sunday. Pre-game? Her show is this upcoming Sunday. We're going to be on the air every Sunday through Labor Day. Um, so if you're interested in some uh, some fun, goofy pre and post, come check us out. It's going to be a blast. Oh, and we'll have we'll have Carmen and uh, Anthony, good friend of yours, and Teresa and y'all all on the podcast at some point through the summer to get a taste of their what they're like. Yeah, your homework is figuring out which one of them is going to watch Fast Nine first, and then they can give it a review. But that is Sunday at 1230. And we have one more podcast this week. Tentatively have a very cool guest lineup. So we will. Mm -hmm. I don't like to jinx myself, as people know. I'm not going to pull Bob Nightingale here. But hopefully (laughs) have a fun one later this week. And yeah, we'll we'll see about that. But either way, subscribe. uh, Leave a review if you like the podcast. Thank you guys for listening. And we will be back on Thursday. (laughs) 